Uh, this is the uh, March 16th, 2021 Town of Monroe Planning Board regular meeting. Uh, Noreen, would you please do roll call attendance? Anthony Arrow is out. Lisa McQuaid. Present. Bonnie Franson. Present. Jason Sorinsky is recused. Jeff Manson. Present. John Allegro. Here. And Pat Shea. Here. We have a quorum. All right, with that, I will point out the fire exits. Uh, we have those in front of us, the two double doors. Uh, we have another set of doors uh, leading out to the main lobby and parking lot, and then another one uh, to this side of the building. So with that, let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. So the first item on the agenda is the notice of public scoping and the public scoping document that was submitted for 208 Business Center. Uh, take this down. Village of Monroe DEIS. Uh, I have this on the screen. Uh, Ashley, should we, we have comments from Sean. I, have, I received a phone call from Kurt Rother today. Okay. Who is the engineer for this project for the village. Um, he wanted to let you know that the village reached out to him that we were holding this meeting tonight that he didn't know about it, which was fine. And he said that he needed to be here because he couldn't. He had another project meeting to go to, otherwise he would have come. But if you have any questions, to feel free to reach out to him or his office, and he would answer anything that you have. He's sorry he couldn't come tonight, but he wanted me to mention it to you before you got going. Great. Um, uh, Ashley, do you want to kind of give an overview of how we should proceed? I have comments. Others may have comments. Should, my thinking is that we'll just literally scroll through the draft scoping document um, and raise comments and questions. And then uh, between Sean's comments and the planning board's comments, we will um, compile something or you could compile a memo and then submit that to the village on our behalf. Oh, wait, wait. You may be muted. Hold he also said that they might be keeping it open for 10 days after for written comment. He assumed they would do that. He didn't know 100%. Now we can. Okay. Okay, George, are you saying something? Yeah, I, I wasn't getting Ashley what she was saying. Okay, I'll try and point it down toward the, uh, the laptop. Um, that might help a little better. Uh, a little bit, and let me increase the volume on my laptop. Hopefully that helps, okay? All right, so we're going to go through this. And uh, the first page, I just had a general comment that I didn't see in the scoping document where they actually listed the property owners or the applicant. And I thought in general, as part of the overall intro to the scoping document, they should talk about who the property owners and or the applicants are. Anyone wants me to stop, let me know. Project scoping, description of the proposed action. This is where it says the sponsor, and I think it'd be useful in the beginning to say who the sponsor is. Uh, it talks about the project will incorporate a lighting plan, landscaping plan, and other amenities uh, to include water, sewer, stormwater management infrastructure. 
Uh, I'm pretty sure that the village, the planning board, acts in an architectural review capacity, and I didn't see any reference to architectural plans or architectural renderings. And I think that since it's going to be at a highly visible gateway, and I think we should use the word gateway into the village, that there needs to be consideration of um, the proposed architecture and character of the building that they're, they're building, and also taking into consideration its layout relative to what you'll be able to see, whether it's the parking, loading areas, et cetera. General scoping cons uh, considerations, this is usually standard language in terms of the DEIS, how it will be written, that'll be supported by narrative, discussion, or graphics. Um, it says a full-scale site plan will be included. I tend to like to include in a scope that they'll include certain maps where applicable, so just to highlight it. Um, this is a draft environmental impact statement. It'll have dates submitted, the name and location of the project. Village of Monroe Planning Board is the lead agency. They'll include the name and address of the project sponsor, but again, I think that should be on the scope itself. Primary preparer of the EIS, as well as the other consultants, state of acceptance, deadline. This is all standard kind of format for an EIS. So then they have a summary of the DEIS, section one. Summary will include information found elsewhere in the body of the DEIS, but of a minimum brief description of the action, a list of all the involved agencies with required approvals and permits. Um, sometimes there is an administrative permit, so they're not technically an involved agency. So I think it should just be a list of all permits and approvals and all involved agencies, just so we, just to be comprehensive. Um, when they get to the project alternatives, thus they say a comparative assessment will be provided relative to each issues identified in the final scoping, scoping document. Um, it's always useful to have a chart to compare the different alternatives, whether it's traffic, sewer, water. Right now, based on the alternatives they're proposing, I don't know that there's going to be a big variation or difference, but um, it's useful to summarize it in a chart. So description of the proposed action, section two, anyone with comments yet? So site description, they talk about description of the existing character of the site and surrounding area. And I think it's always useful to define what the area is considered as far as the project area. So my suggestion is when they do the existing character that it be within a quarter mile um, of the proposed project or some distance if it's more or less, but to define what that area is that they're going to describe and to map it. Um, they have brief history of former uses of the site. Um, I'd like them to note that they should provide any environmental site assessment that they've done for the property. Typically in these real estate transactions, they'll look at, they'll have an environmental site assessment that looks at potential past conditions, dumping, hazardous wastes, et cetera, so I think they should provide the ESA. Identification of the exact dimensions of the property. Um, they may have provided this in the application. I didn't know if we should say, you know, provide the deeds in an appendix, or if that's part of the application, but I threw that in there. Project description, description of the infrastructure, site plan. Um, they talk about conformity to the village zoning law with narrative and graphic uh, forms. I saw that the ZBA was part of the circulation, and I don't know if they need variances. I think that's why uh, Jason has accused himself. But, but I, know, I don't know if it's a potential or if there actually is a variance. Uh, not, it wasn't I'm really, not sure. I, don't I don't know, it was in the description. Down. ZBA to the village. Village ZBA, right. Yeah, so I didn't see anything for our guys. So I think the scope, if there's a need for variances, they should be upfront and note what they are, at least, you know, to the extent that they know what they are. And then again, in terms of the description of the proposed action, I think the architecture and the visuals need to be considered too. Utilities, objectives of the project sponsor. 
So under project purpose, needs, and benefits, public need for the proposed action, including its economic benefits to the community, I think we should ask them if they're seeking a payment in lieu of taxes or otherwise a pilot or if they're looking for any kind of exemptions, tax exemptions, you know, benefits that would affect um, the fiscal analysis. There's a construction section. So it just talks about expect, expected year of completion, construction period, environmental protective measures, hours and days of the week, construction access and staging, areas for material handling and storage. Operations, proposed use of the facility, anticipated hours of operation. Then they have the list of all required or requested approvals and associate involved agencies will be on the list. It says agencies identified as interested and involved include, and they provide the list, so that's where it says ZBA. Um, but I think it's useful if they were actually to say what or why these are involved agencies, like a chart that has the agency and then, you know, if town board is identified, why is the town board identified? Or just call it interested agency. Or if it's, a, if it's the village of Monroe planning board, say they have to approve the site plan. But be, in the scope, I think it'd be useful to have a little more information about these agencies and what they're responsible for approving or permitting. Okay, section three. So environmental setting, existing conditions, anticipated impacts and proposed mitigation measures. So soils and geology, usually it's soils, geology, and topography, um, that section. And I'd like to make sure that they specifically include a grading map and a cut and fill map, and that they have um, estimates of how much cut and fill will be on the site, and are they going to be trucking it away or bringing in fill? Do you have that announced? In the proposed, okay. Um, I had a note, geotech, um, that if they're doing, are they doing any kind of geotech analysis, especially with regard to where there might be rock, mm -hmm. and that they include that. So we talk about grading plan for impact, slopes analysis, discussion potential soil erosion. Ah, okay, estimated proposed cut and fill earthwork volumes is there. So when they talk about volume of earth and rock to be imported or exported and the related um, traffic implications, you know, are they going to be having dump trucks coming or going because of it? So if that isn't mentioned somewhere in construction. Sure. Water resources. So pre and post development conditions of surface water, floodplains, and wetlands. So I had two. One under the existing, they didn't evaluate the other was under uh, what section under the proposed mitigation uh, was making sure that the town of Monroe was uh, cited as uh, I'm sorry, the town of Monroe Planning Board was cited as uh, the one to review the SWIP since they will be discharging onto town lands. So um, that, that is, sorry, that would be Town Monroe Town Board, not, not Planning Board. Okay. So um, one of the things, this is supposed to be an all-encompassing water resources section um, on surface waters, floodplains, and wetlands. And as much as they mention floodplains, wetlands, and surface waters, it doesn't talk really about any impact on wetlands. Um, are they filling them? Are there any, um, et cetera, when you talk about the potential impacts? I'm not seeing anything about wetlands. Um, I'm also not seeing anything about uh, impact to the quality of those resources, unless it's in mitigation. Here it says means of protecting Orange and Rockland Lake, a Class B water body from impacts, but they have to say what the impacts are to that water body first, and they have to talk about the impacts to wetlands. And when they talk about the wetlands, it'll be dealt with under ecology, but wetlands, while it's a water resource, it's, a, it's an also an ecological habitat. So they need to cover that under the ecology section too. 
One of the things I considered in relation to, I believe that would kind of fit also under that section is, um, because we have taken into consideration uh, adjacent properties, the areas of the existing uh, Orange and Rockland Park, or uh, that there are areas of the park that already don't drain well and they hold surface uh, water after a heavy rain. Uh, and that's particularly the area between the bottom of the slope um, from Orange and Rockland Road and the interior park road down in the area of the former highway department sheds. And so I, I think they need to answer the question how will the project uh, either exacerbate or improve this issue? Bring up. Um Ashley, are you seeing my screen or do you still see the scope? I still see the scope. All right. Uh, I'm just bringing up, although you can't see it, the area of the proposed project. Oh, where are we? If anyone needs to refer to the map for any reason, I can pull it up because it's here. Don't need that. Uh, all right, so, oops. Vegetation and wildlife. Um, you know, oftentimes with the vegetation and wildlife, there's this focus on endangered, threatened, special concern, and rare plants. I think they should just do an ecological survey and go out, survey the site, and see what's there. And it says a field survey conducted during appropriate times of the year. What does that mean? Um, they should do it in the spring, at least, and in the summer when things are more active. You know, not right now, because <laughs> there's not, you know, th there's not much going on right now. So I think it'd be useful to talk about that. Um, I think they need to specifically refer to wetlands, both on site and um, adjacent to. So they talk about the existing setting, the identification and description of on-site vegetative communities. They should also talk about vegetation. Um, they'll look at the heritage program, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services database, which is fine. Um, but again, I think he is doing a field survey. And I don't know to what extent there will be wildlife present because it's kind of a, surrounded by other developed areas, but they still should do a, a more um, more analysis in that regard with just species in general. So then they talk about evaluation of potential impacts to vegetation and wildlife resulting from the proposed development, um, vegetative cover. I don't see anything mentioned about trees. And are they clear cutting trees? What are the size of the trees? Um, woodland, so just some evaluation of what's being cut down you know, mature trees, et cetera. Bonnie. Yep. Um, so in relation to wildlife, so the adjacent water body, the Orange and Rotten Lake, is a habitat to Canadian geese, swans, blue heron, uh, multiple species of fish. Uh, it's possible that other species like amphibians or reptiles may use this as a habitat as well. So I think that the question, how is the proposed stormwater drainage going to affect that habitat needs to be part of the scope. Um, also, Orange and Rockland Lake is a primary source of drinking water for local mammals, uh, including, among others, deer and bear. The, uh, I know the scope did include a lot of uh, water quality and obviously the peak runoff because that's part of the SWIP, but did include a lot of water quality testing and evaluation. So uh, I know that is covered um, generally. But, you know, if there's maybe the, if there's something specifically that you're looking for, we could ask for it. I think, you know, I think the question is, and it's, it's in, you know, the Orange and Rockland Lake and this water body is off-site. Um, but can we ask that they do a little bit of sampling to see what the quality is? You know? I don't see why not, because it looks like they're proposing their, their discharge point basically at the lake. So uh, I don't see why we... And are they discharging then within the town of Monroe? Are they proposing I, the discharge point? It looks like it based on the location map. Um, that's on the site plan or the site. 
left is where. The oh. Right. Right. That's where the, the charge is. So over here is where the pipe will be. That's what. That's how it appears. Yeah. And then if you go to the right, to the location map, it shows you where the town line is. Okay. Looks like it's gonna extend beyond. I think there's another parcel in between this parcel it's a little unclear where the lake is. We're looking at the location map, Ashley, of the site plan right now. Based, based on the GIS maps, it looks like the, the parcel in the middle is owned by the village. Okay. Um, and I, then I think beyond that is owned by the town, so. So I think we should get more information. They do have to provide all information on the drainage easement, because it says drainage easement to the benefit of 208 Business Center. Um, you know, I think it'd be useful to know more about what that agreement is because it's not as if, I don't think the town provided an easement recently. So it may be an easement that's on the existing property and- Let's say uh, existing, not proposed. Yeah. And so, you know, what was anticipated as far as any limitations at all, you know, for the drainage easement there? Is it just allowed to drain whatever or was it limited in some way? That's an Ashley question. Bonnie? Yes. While we're on the maps, could you go back to the other map with the trees? Um, I, I don't think I was here when we talked about this the first time. And could you point out the site? Sure. So the site is basically in here. So it's on this side of the YMCA. I think the out parcel, the real the center, Century 21, I think is an out parcel on the corner, right? And then, but I think there's a dwelling here on Gilbert that's part of it. Is that the case? So are those structures going to be torn down or part of the site? They're going to be torn down. So here's the existing building in the corner. I think is the realty. Uh, so I don't see a house in here between the YMCA and that corner. So, oh, here you can see. There. See here? There's a few houses on that street. Yep. So you can see, you can see right here, they have an outline. Here, let me stop sharing and share with, share with Ashley. So. There's another. Yeah, there's one, one here. One here. One above the realty. Is that the old bike place? Right here. Because I think it's several tax parcels. I don't think it's just one tax parcel involved. So that's at least one, two, three structures involved. Um, oh. What are they talking about? I think it's three tax parcels that are. I think it's three tax parcels that. So I think also the scoping document, and I would just, any letter that goes to the um, to the village should remind the applicant that since they're undergoing seeker, they're not allowed to demolish buildings or clear cut property <laughs> while it's ongoing, which we remind <laughs> our own applicants of. So yeah, if you haven't seen the site plan, Lisa, this is it. It's going to be at the corner where 208's coming in right. towards 17M. Um, it is taking that the old bicycle place, several of the houses in between um, the Realty Building and the Y. And it's going to be in the back and all the parking's in the front. Thank you. Yep. Um, go scroll down to where that drainage easement is. The other way, I'm sorry. This scroll way? up. So, 
So I, that orange in Rockland Lake, is that the lake that's in the town-owned land? I believe it is. Okay. 22 years I've been here, I always thought the... <laughs> I think a part the of it ski is, lakes were I think, orange and Rockland. Yeah, Lake. I think a part of it might be um, private, the <clears> upper <throat> part. But I think that's I think that's part of the town park. But let's that's connect. That's connected. I thought that was independent. That body of water in the town park. No, it, it connects under orange and Rockland. It does? Yeah, there's a there's a point where it does. I believe so. Oh. <laughs> it's a it's a very small. Point. I was going to bring up the Orange County GIS information. You may be unhappy with me having so many maps open. I believe under Orange and Silver. Part of the lake. Privately owned, Auckland Road, Park and Rides, and can you see this, Ashley? Right now, it's just pinwheeling. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, this is the new map. So uh, there's supposed to be, how do I get this to close? All right, so let's zoom in. There's the lake. If I can just click on this now. That's this parcel here. that it's owned, I, it's saying the municipality is the town of Monroe? Yeah. I used to be able to click on the, um, it would bring you to the real property section. And I think the lower left hand uh, side of the box. Over left here? Hand. Yeah. Is that, does that say image mate? It says zoom to up here maybe? Doc. Oh, I think that's that's I think that's town of Monroe. So let's just check. So this property here comes It'll up. They'll tell as, you the owner in that box. This is saying village of Monroe. Mm -hmm. And that's saying town of Monroe. Yeah, that's odd. Because it, it might be in the village, but it's owned by the town of Monroe. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. So this is the one of the par parcels in the village of Monroe. There we go, 208 Business Center, LLC. So, yes, so this looks like this is the town of Monroe in the village of Monroe. So, base maps. Imagery. Here's the Y. 
And so they're cobbling together this parcel here, the vacant one, this parcel, which I think is the, um, the bi old bike shop, right? This here, which is a house, this here, which is a house, and I don't know who owns 27, if that's part of it. No, uh, that's YMCA. So it's one, two, three, four. four lots, right. Lots three, four, seven, eight. Yeah, so although the match of the property tax lines and the aerials aren't always perfect, clearly they have to go across town of Monroe property to be able to drain to the lake. And that lake is town of Monroe for sure. This is also town of Monroe. And then I think up here, this is Orange and Rockland Lake. I don't know if technically that's also Orange and Rockland below. That's not saying who owns it. What type of drainage are we talking about? Oh, ski delight. <laughs> mm -hmm. What <laughs> yeah, type that's of drainage? The, ski, are... the water ski park. What type of drainage <laughs> are we talking about? The runoff. Uh, drainage would be the stormwater runoff okay. from Thank yeah you. from the property. So. Apparently, there's a little channel or or an overflow right on that property line that, there it is. See that little channel of water? Over here? Yeah. Right, so this is, I don't know which direction it's going in. I think it might be going in that direction. Which way? Uh, from south to north, yeah. Or, yeah. The dam is on the northern side of the lake. Okay. Is there any dam on this side? I don't believe so. John, the dam is on the northern side of the upper lake. Correct. Yeah, not, not that. Whatever this is. Lovely green lake. <laughs> uh, correct. Right of the the northernmost point of Orange and Rockland Lake. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh, it's calling. This map is calling it Orange and Rockland okay. Lake. And then what happens if you go? So it must be both sides. Water ski lake. <laughs> uh, come on, this isn't right. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about this mapping. All right, so let me escape out of that. Let's go back to our scope. Uh, Tony, I mean, just texted Tony, and he said, uh, Tony Cardone, you said it doesn't have a name. That that body water in in the park in the park is unnamed. So I think that what they're talking about with that easement into Orange and Rockland Lake may not be, may be misnamed. I don't know in general if it's just understood, but you know, one of the mitigations is always that you could have a reduction in the size of the project, whether it's impervious, whether it's building size, you know, that there's, you don't have to have the largest building to cover the entire property. So when we talk about proposed mitigation measures in general, I just said, you know, reduction in size of project, and I think that could apply in a couple places. Um, the cultural resources, they do say a phase one historic and archaeological survey will be conducted. Um, I think they also need to see what the integrity is of those houses that are there. I don't know if some of them are older. You know, the bike property um, and the bike building were obviously older, but, you know, it was being used for an alternative use, but the houses themselves, I don't know what condition they're in and if they're considered historic or potentially historic. So in as much as the phase one may deal with that, I think it'd be nice to say that explicitly in the scoping document, to specifically look at all the buildings and structures that are getting demolished and their historic and or architectural integrity or character. And when we talk about mitigation measures, and I don't know if this is a mitigation measure or if it's an alternative, um, Ashley, but you know, if those homes are in good condition, if they're attractive buildings, you know, could they be preserved, you know, and reused as part of an overall development rather than demolishing them? And I don't know whether that could be an alternative or if that would be a mitigation.
Yeah. Well, I think it's also a community character issue and a community pattern because what we're accustomed to seeing at that property is obviously wooded land and houses. And, you know, the bike shop was converted. Um, you know, they're smaller scale. Uh, so, you know, if in some way they could keep some of that and a backdrop of woodland and still have a center behind that, at least the character, you know, when you come in through the gateway would be a little more intact than just demolishing it and putting up um, parking lot. So it's both historic, it's also community character, you know, kind of the village pattern. Um, so give, give it some thought about how to maybe address, address it. I have another question. When you mentioned the gateway, is that going to be the entrance to the center? The uh, entrance to the center is here. So when you're coming off of 208, uh, you'll have both, it looks like a right in and a right out. It has to be that way because of the fact that that's right, um, one way pattern in there. And then it looks like they'll be also able to exit onto Gilbert Street and they really are not showing per se what the pattern will be here. Um, but again, you have limitations as to where you can go because of the you know, existing pattern. This doesn't show any proposed changes. So if they have right in and right out, and if this can only be right out, how do you get back out to 208. Straight across to the left. 208. Oh, at the intersection. <clears throat> they may kind of try and come around and, yeah. I mean, so I will say that the worst section in the scoping document is the transportation section. Absolutely horrible. Um, which it, it needs to be beefed up quite a bit. It's very generic and they really need, I, you know, they will have a traffic engineer, I'm sure, studying it. But you know, I, what I see here is a pattern of 208, which is southbound, right? At this point, do you still have, I'm trying to figure out. Right. Bonnie. This, this is, it's already separated here. So, so I, I also observed that they talked about, um, what was the quotation? They, they were referencing improve, uh, proposed uh, roadway improvements, although on the site plan document, there's nothing to that. However, um, I don't know if it was late last night or, or this morning, the traffic study for this project was on a uh, place on the, on the village website. So in taking a look at that, there's significant changes to the traffic pattern in the area that are being proposed. If you go to the village website uh, in their bulletin board, you'll find the traffic survey and on page seven is a figure of a very much redesigned traffic situation in that whole section. So. Yep, this document. I'll share it with you in a second, Ashley. This is the this is the figure we're talking about this one and there, there's one below it but that's the Ooh. this is the significant one. Got to absorb that. Huh? I said I have to absorb that. That looks. I thought that was a picture of me and Ashley. You had to absorb. <laughs> no 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 no. This <laughs> like, this me. spider web. <laughs> can can you turn that counterclockwise? Uh, let me see. You want me to rotate it? Please. Uh, let's see it, what happens here. Uh, yes, and then. Kind of scroll okay, down. yeah, so that's the mobile. Wait a minute. Come up a little. A little bit more. What's interesting is they're showing a future North Main Street project. Right. So we're going to have this great gateway that's going to have the mobile station right in the middle. So what's, so what's being proposed in the traffic study, based on what I was able to observe today, it, it basically, instead of 
208 splitting off, following around one way along the curve. It becomes two ways there and becomes one continuous road with two uh, traffic intersections, one where the extent, uh, Gilbert Street extension is and one at what will be the, and, uh, the Route 208 entrance to the business center. And then it diverts the road around to the intersection of what would be Scunamonk and North Main at a third traffic light. And then there's kind of a stub road that leads up by what is the, um, the Prince Center, which is behind this uh, future project by others, it is labeled. Uh, uh, 424 to 434 North Main Street, it's, it's unclear whether that's a commercial project, a residential uh, project, well, frankly. The, the other odd thing is that's going up toward DG Realty, isn't it? It is. <laughs> but. But then it, it dies out at kind of the base of the slope there as it leads into the properties with those other houses that are off of Scunamonk. Yeah, I, I, that's just odd to me. Right, it doesn't actually go on to the <laughs> DG property, and, and but it's... Is there a longer-term plan there? Um, <laughs> or, you know, what is the purpose of showing that? Yeah, I, that one I haven't figured out. It, it looks like a road to nowhere. Um, so, I mean, there, there's pros and cons to what's being proposed here, but at, le at least in the traffic study, it shows some significant changes uh, and, and that, they, that they're being cognizant of the issues of coming off of uh, the Gilbert Street extension, which are significant. Uh, a lot of the challenges that are uh, really in the area because of the mobile station being in that triangle, um, it it does mitigate the traffic that flows through. Where you have the the stub of North Main coming into across from the Route 208 business entrance, there's actually a lot of traffic that flows through there where it's not actually a road. Well, that little island there, right? Isn't that the Village of Monroe's island? I believe it is. Or is that the OT? Uh, I, my understanding, I thought it was Village of Monroe. I, yeah. thought, I thought that's Unless what Unless it's the just part of me. the DOT right away. Because I know the Village of Monroe has, the Village of Monroe has their sign there, but maybe it's just, again, it looks like it might be in the DOT right away. I'm not seeing a parcel here. So there's the mobile. And this is, I think, where they have that right. road going up toward this direction. I mean, and what what appears to be a road there just may be a a widened driveway. But I mean, what what that is now is is mostly parking along that driveway, and it looks like that's being obliterated in this proposal. So I'm not quite sure where all the people for the print center are going to park, unless the well, idea yeah is, that might be their parking right there. unless that you know is yeah. the thought is this future project will also contain parking for that facility. So they are, this should be the um, the print center, yeah. right? 412 North Main Street, LLC. And this. Right. All right. Yeah, right now that there's a realty. Um, Century 21. It was Century 21. Now I think it's called EXT. Realty in that building? Exit. Yeah, oh, right. Exit Realty. Exit Realty. Yeah. So that would take that out. Um, all right, let's get back to the scope. So this was all, um, that's a, I guess the question is whether that is all being incorporated into this project or if DOT is expected expected to do some of those improvements or what is the applicant responsible for? Um, let me stop sharing and then share. So visual. Um, I don't see anything in terms of a discussion about photo simulations. Um, or any architecturals again. 
It talks about using or assessing impacts based on uh, the New York State DEC um, policy. Uh, and also, I think that policy document is actually dated. There's a newer updated policy. I don't know if it's been adopted or not already, um, but they should be probably referring to the latest policy if it's been adopted. Um, so they have dis discussion of the elements that contribute to the visual character, description of the project's visibility from Town of Monroe Park, 208 Gilbert Street, um, YMCA facility. Um, it may be visible from other areas. I mean, I, I think they need to provide a map, which is typical of a visual analysis, where they go out a quarter mile, half mile, and look at what the topography is and see if there's parks or other things within proximity that they should be evaluating. Um, to do the analysis part of the EIS, not pre-select all the sites, you know, at this point in time. Um, description of changes in the visual character. We'll discuss the impact on the views from the analysis points. I think they need to do the analysis to pick the analysis points as part of this. Um, it may be useful to do a balloon test or a stakeout so that we know what the, you know, what the extent of the project's going to be and how much is going to be removed. Um, so definitely photo simulation, and again, I see nothing about architecture, um, and they should definitely include all mechanicals as part of this, and they should be addressing landscaping as well, which I think they have called out other places. But landscaping will be important under visual as well. Transportation. This is very generic. Uh, areas and intersection be analyzed will be done in consultation with DOT and the Village of Monroe Traffic Consultant. That's absolutely um, um, unacceptable. Uh, they should do that now, and it should be in the scoping document, and we should know what they are. So, you know, they need to talk about how they address COVID traffic, um, you know, the fact that there's less of it right now, and what will happen in the future. Um, they need to include 208 in Scunamunk, 208 in the 17 ramps, 208 at 17M, 208 at Orico. Um, there has to be a whole methodology and analysis set forth in the traffic study, which isn't here. Um, so, you know, I don't know what else to add other than this, this is absolutely um, generic and it shouldn't be left up to the DOT and the traffic consultant. It should be set forth in the scoping document so everybody knows what's being evaluated. Any thoughts on that, Ashley? In the TIS? Right. Right. I mean, because it talks about Village of Mono Traffic Consultant was undertaken at a very early stage. Um, but when was that? Was it pre-COVID, post-COVID? Um, you know, has the project changed? Um, is this a recent traffic impact study? Whatever the parameters are of the traffic impact study, since it's being incorporated into the EIS, should be part of the scoping document. Um, you know, I, I, I think you just need to pull out from the traffic impact study, and then we have to see whether that traffic impact study, in fact, was acceptable. Although if DOT was involved, then hopefully it is comprehensive, going all the way to 17. Um, land use and zoning. I'm sorry, Bonnie, before sure. you, just before you get away from traffic. transportation, yeah, can you scroll back up to mitigation measures? Yep. Um, so first of all, there's a, there's a reference under the proposed mitigation measures. Uh, to improvements to Old Ridge Road and, well, and other roads 
affected by the additional traffic generation. So, I mean, I, I think we can see from the photo that we just looked at what they're talking about there, but I, I have not been able to locate any old ridge road in that area of the village or town, and I'm not sure it refers to, I'm not sure what it refers to, what, what road they're talking about there. Um, I also noted many of the roads and intersections that you noted, I, I, I strongly agree that it needs to take into consideration the traffic at the uh, on and off ramps, both at eastbound and westbound uh, 17. That, that's a major feeder into the area. And also, I, I think take a little more into consideration about the difficulties exiting and entering the surrounding commercial properties not limited to the YMCA, the Exxon station, the mobile station, and the Prince Center. It, you know, also, so the, the site plan shows significant size commercial buildings surrounded completely by parking spaces, interior driveways, and circulation routes suitable for car traffic. There seems to be few provisions that are made for safe walkways for pedestrians, bike paths for cyclists, or an area for the safe discharge of passengers from taxis or buses. Uh, all of these are common or growing forms of transportation in this area of the village and the town, uh, particularly with the, since this site is located within a quarter mile of the Heritage Trail. I would have an expectation that people will come right up the trail uh, on foot or by bike and come up Gilbert Street to this uh, new facility. Uh, the project is also located within walking distance of a number of existing residential areas in the village and the town, as well as projects that are both under construction or before the municipal planning boards. And I just feel like I see a couple of crosswalks. I don't see any real safe passage from where you enter the facility across those parking lots except to walk through where the cars are driving that may not be the, the safest and best option. Um, you know, nothing for bicycle parking when you're right off of a, one of the major bike routes in the county. And uh, again, I, I think that there needs to be some sort of provision for public transportation, which is, uh, you know, a growing use. So I'd like to see all of that taken into consideration, or at least, why, you know, why isn't that being... Uh, looked into further um and and just to comment as you were mentioning all that in looking at this creighton manning document because they talk about a tis study but this i don't think is the tis study this is a response um to comments raised by dot and i think this is providing supporting additional documentation so it kind of alludes to what was studied but it actually isn't it doesn't seem to be the TIS study from from at least what I could tell. It appears that uh, feedback was garnished from Village of Monroe Police Department, from right. um, Monroe uh, Ambulance Corps, and the DOT, and and even some of that feedback points exactly to some of the things that we're discussing this evening. Right. So um, I, I was and the reason I was scrolling through this was to see if there was anything that referenced Old Ridge Road. Um, So when I do a, um, a search, it doesn't. So maybe it's referenced in the actual traffic impact study, um, but it's not there. So again, I think whatever the traffic impact study, whatever the analysis has been done, oops, the intersections, um, that needs to all be incorporated into the scoping document. And I think any of the comments or letters or other information that relates to these studies should be incorporated into the appendices so that everybody has the ability to see what the comments have been so far on these on these studies. Um, land use and zoning, again, I think we should reference a specific map and that they should, you know, let's say go out a quarter mile. You know, what is the area that's going to be evaluated? Normally, as part of a scoping document, you would identify a study area. And so I think they need to point out and identify a study area, you know, which they will evaluate as part of this. Oh, sorry, it's a half mile. <laughs> this is, I was doing this very quickly. It does say this, on adjacent property surrounding area, i.e. within a half mile. My bad. 
but if we could please map it. Uh, discussion of recommendations for Sarai and surrounding area from the village comprehensive plan. Let's also add from the town comprehensive plan if they're going and using town property. Um, and they don't talk about any regional plans, open space plans, county plans. Um, there should be a, a, a more robust discussion of consistency with other plans. If there isn't, if it isn't here. If there are variances, they need to evaluate the variances within the EIS. Uh, utilities water. Um, did you touch upon this, Sean? I didn't just because I know it's, it's going to be getting water from the village. Okay. From the tent, right. Talking to your mic. <laughs> It's off. I yeah, hit the mute button. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said I didn't uh, touch on the water just because I know the village owns the water and, um, you know, that I'm not sure what the town's, uh, I guess, view would be of the village's water. Yeah. You know? I, I just had, again, looking at it as a scope, provide estimate of water consumption by use using worst case analysis. Um, and, and speaking to the project description, something to add to the scoping document is, I believe they said office and retail use. So is there an assumption, you know, is there a worst case analysis that, you know, what's the percentage of office versus what's the percentage of retail? Yeah. You know, what's assumed in terms of parking or, um, you know, demand of water, wastewater, I think, we should understand what their assumptions are for doing the analysis with regard to the, the proportion of uses on the site. Um, and so with wastewater, um, just the same thing, you know, just to add capacity and demand by use, worst case analysis, and it will go to Harriman Sewage Treatment Plant. And then proposed adverse impacts that cannot, cannot be avoided. And then alternatives. Um, the following alternatives, no action, that's always part of it. Prior to 08 Monroe Plaza alternative, I had what is this? Um, and could they add it to the scope as an attachment? Does anybody know what the prior to 08 Monroe Plaza alternative was? Did you see that in the village's website? Okay. I, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, so I don't know what that is, so I don't know what they're studying as an alternative. And then they had two building alternatives on existing separate tax parcels. And I had, how about multiple buildings in more of a village pattern, um, if that's possible? And maybe adding to that preservation of some of the existing buildings there. Um, irretrievable, irretrievable, irreversible commitment of resources, effects on use and conservation of energy. They don't really talk about um, green infrastructure, I don't think in stormwater, and maybe that's just something that you have to do anyway as part during, of a SWIP. Yeah, during design. But I think it would be useful to um, add somewhere in the scope a consideration of green infrastructure, green design um, as part of the project. Or something like that, yeah, something. And um, quick question. Um, with EISs now, Ashley, do they have to look at climate change? Um, matters with the amendments? Yes, I believe that it is something, let me just pull up the regs quickly. I can't recall exactly how it's worded, if it's something that is mandatory or if it's something, one of those things that. So I had um, added, where is noise and air quality? <laughs>
Right. So if we if we quick, you can see the um, EAF long EAF part two, Ashley. Okay. So um, impact on land, I'm just trying to see, you know, is there something that's been missed? So they're, they're covering soils, topography, and geology, um, geologic features. They are, you know, there aren't any national, natural, national natural landmarks. They are talking about geology from the, um, you know, bedrock perspective. Surface water, they are covering surface water. Um, Fresh waters, they're de freshwater wetlands are dealing with um, turbidity in a water body. So we talked about water quality and specifically analyzing the lake. Um, I think we need more in terms of both water quality and then um, the the environment, you know, for aquatic resources. Um, soil erosion, water quality, water bodies, pesticides, herbicides, impact on groundwater. So. Um, they're get, they're, uh, the water is coming from the village, so they don't really talk about groundwater at all. Um, do we know if there are any wells, any municipal wells, or anything in that area? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, most of the village gets their water from Mombasha, right? And I know they had some wells. Okay. Um, for instance, I think they had wells by the racetrack, or at one point they had um, drilled some wells. I don't know what's actually tied into the system. They may have some wells. I just don't know if there are any around here. Um, or if there are any general water supply wells in the vicinity that, you know, are there areas? You're, you're on village water where you are? No? Town water fed from uh, the village. Yes. Oh, sorry, town oh, yeah. water? Yeah, I am. Okay. Wait, I'm in a water district. Okay. Ta which is town water fed from the village. Right. right. Okay. So. But, but we have DG management that's going to have their own. Their own you know, wells. Right, right across the street. So. Right. So I think, so I don't, again, I don't know who's all on um, village water or if some of those other areas, if potentially they're not on water. So I think right. they should con cover groundwater in some way within a certain radius well, wait a minute. So they're not—they're just going to be pulling from the village. So groundwater, it would be more a water quality issue, right, than anything else. Right. It's not going to like. It'll be, the, it'll be the drainage and you know, on the groundwater caused by the drainage from, from the water site. water quality. Right. Okay. Um, impact on flooding. They talk about floodplains generally. Impacts on air, they did not cover. So I think they need to cover air and talk about, you know, are they using, are they gonna connect to gas? I think they're in Orange and Rockland um, territory there. So I'm sure that's available, but you know, still air quality from a vehicle perspective, because you're gonna have a lot of changes potentially to that area. Um, that's actually another thing, Ashley. So from a cumulative impact, I didn't, I don't know, did they show, did they have a category called cumulative impacts? So they discussed general. Okay. So, but it so the reason I'm asking is that in order to implement this project, they may need traf roadway improvements, and the roadway improvements themselves um, have impacts. So the analysis that they do shouldn't just consider the business center itself, but it needs to consider whatever other improvements they need to be able to implement their project. 
And then the cumulative, clearly they're showing in the traffic study another potential project across the street. So kind of across the board, you know, the impacts from that other project should also be considered in cumulative impacts. And DG Realty um, or any of our applications that might be in the area should be part of the cumulative analysis. They should be aware of DG Realty because we had a conversation with them, but I think we should note that there's DG Realty and they should include a discussion. Um, so air quality would really especially be from the, from the vehicle, vehicular perspective of air emissions. Um, plants and animals, they did cover. Um, agricultural resources, that's not um, really a relevant concern here. Aesthetic resources, uh, they are addressing, um, but again, I think it needs uh, much more um, in the way of methodology. Impact on historic and archaeological, they said they were doing a phase one study. Impact on open space and recreation, um, certainly in terms of the land use, they have to indicate any impact that might exist to the town's park. Um, critical environmental area, I don't believe we're in a CEA. I don't know, um, Ashley, there's the Ramapo River Sole Source Aquifer, and I know it may be a CEA, but I don't know if it's a CEA in Orange County. So maybe we could just look into that. Uh, impact on transportation, we talked about them needing to, in, to um, really fill that section in. Impact on energy. Um, did they address energy? They said utilities. I don't know if they specifically mentioned energy. Uh, they, I don't believe they did, so, but the cause data definitely talks about it. Okay, so we'll need to mention energy, noise, odor, and light. Um, they should touch upon, upon odor if any of their activities would or wouldn't you know, cause odor. If not, then it's not a concern. You know, if it's standard retail and office, it's just probably you know, garbage and things of that nature. Um, and lighting, they did talk about. Impact on human health. Um, 1,500 feet of a school, hospital, daycare, remediation. We did ask for, um, we did ask for the environmental site assessment. Did they have community facilities there? Analysis of community services and facilities? Yeah, <laughs> So I think any impact on fire, ambulance, um, you know, emergency service providers especially. Yeah, and then schools, I don't know that that'll be a concern. Um, they're not generating students, but more from a school bus where people drop it, you know, they're kind of not in a neighborhood. I don't think it's gonna be a concern, but certainly the emergency service providers, they, they need to include. Um, Solid waste, they do need to address, like how much solid waste are they generating, um, both in construction and uh, operational. Um, in fact, I think that's kind of required, typically, consideration of solid waste, so they need to add that somewhere, if they haven't. Uh, community plans, uh, they didn't talk about county plans, regional plans, they need to do that. Community character, um, we kind of touched upon it more from the perspective of the building's um, architectural scale, what's around them. So, and then we talked about earlier noise and air quality, which we just covered here. So, um, is there anything else that we haven't talked about? There were a couple of things I noticed. Uh, so we've been provided a copy of their completed uh, EAF long form. And so there were a couple of things that just stuck out to me from there. I don't know how many of them are quite pertinent to the scope or not, but um, one of the things it talks to, in C2D, it talks about the surrounding recreational um, areas, but there's not a mention of the Orange and Rockland Park that borders the rear of the project site. It talks about the Heritage Trail, the airplane park, things like that. Um, so I think they have to take that into consideration. And, and 
when in the draft scope, they seem to refer to it as a, just Town of Monroe Park. Uh, I believe its proper name is uh, Orange and Rockland Park, or it's also known as O&R Park. Uh, I did check a, a communication I had with um, our supervisor on that actual subject from back in the summer we were talking about it, and he told me at the time it was O&R Park. Um, it, we talked a little bit about referencing uh, proposed improvements to New York State 208 and Gilbert Street Extension, but there's nothing on the site plan that indicates that. You know, it's only in the recently uh, distributed traffic mm, information that are posted on the village site that there's any of that, but it specifically mentions that there are proposed improvements on the site plan, and, and we don't see those there. So that obviously has to be adjusted. Uh, in D2J2, it, it mentioned there's an anticipation of two semi-trailer deliveries per day. Um, I think that and the fact that it's one centrally designed loading zone uh, on the site plan kind of points to a large store in a retail space rather than multiple stores in a strip mall type format. But we don't really know that. There isn't enough of a narrative uh, or description of the project and what's anticipated to be there. And I think that's instructive, uh, including to what we have to consider for stormwater runoff. If there's, if one of the retail facilities, for example, is um, distributing hazardous chemicals, as it would be appropriate, if there's spillage in the loading zone, that's directly on top of one of the proposed catch basins for stormwater, which is going to lead right into the discharge. So I have a an interest in that. Uh, D2. L2. The out Can we just quick, D2A, yeah. they do talk about rock crushing, so I think that they need to, in the construction section, address rock crushing, um, both, I don't know what kind of activity, but from a vibrational and from a noise perspective, um, temporary impacts from that. Okay. All right. I'm just moving up. I'm trying to get to where you are. So here's the water usage, 8,400. They need to 8,300 gallons per day, but we don't know what that's what the assumptions are for that. Um, wastewater, okay, we're on E. Impervious, 4.8 acres. So, are they trying to stay under the five threshold? Probably. To not put in stormwater basins. No, so the, the slope is required at one acre. Oh, one, I know the SWIP is, but then... And there's a phase, um, you can request a five-acre waiver or provide a phasing plan to okay. stay under um, five acres. Okay. There's additional requirements if you do request the five-acre waiver. Okay. Which is basically disturbing more than five acres at one time. Okay. Uh, you were up at J. Where were you? Um... It looked, yeah, D2J okay. was where I mentioned the... Here we go. Uh, D2J2 is where it mentions the two uh, semi-trailer truck trips a day, yep. which is, frankly, not a lot. And, and I w again, I would think if you had uh, multiple different units of retail, you'd have more than that. Um, in D2L2... Uh, so it's talking about hours of operation uh, during operations from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. What I'm not clear about that was, does that include the hours that the stores and offices are open, or does it include all the time, even including before uh, the store is open, after, for opening and closing procedures? Um, and then if, it, if that includes all three, what are the anticipated hours that the stores, offices might be open to customers? I think that's important for traffic. I think that's important for um, uh, uh, living environment considerations. So do we, speaking to this, do they talk about, you know, we haven't been part of the village board discussions or, or planning board. Is this a multi-tenant building or could this be one tenant? I mean, I think the, the fact that it, they're looking to do off uh, retail on and the office. ground floor and then office above indicates multi-tenant. But the question is, Again, how many tenants are we talking about? Right. So if they if they approve this project and maybe it's to alternatives, they I think they said the building's going to be 35 feet high and it's going to be two stories. But could they, in theory, do one big retail building? Two levels. Well, or just swap it out and do one retail building. Could they put a big box in there? 
I think I think we'd want to know if if they could at all put a big box in, or if this is strictly both offices and retail. Take the retail, or I'm sorry, the office component out at a later time. You mean? Right. Could that? I mean, could this be swapped out for a I, for a big box? I guess it could, right? Right. I mean, do you think we should raise that, Ashley? But wouldn't that have a less of a demand? I don't know. I'm. I don't, I don't think it did. So uh, you know, where they have the, in the beginning, to just the operation of the right there. Yeah, because here they say in the scope, um, 50,000 square feet of leasable space to be used for retail type uses with the balance of the first floor area being common areas. Second floor is proposed to consist of an additional approximately 30,000 square feet of leasable floor area for office use. So when they say retail and then common areas, is that like an internal little strip commercial center? Is it like a little mini mall where people, I mean, what are common areas? I, I don't know what that means, so that's why I'm asking, I don't think I understand from this um, what exactly they're envisioning when they say common areas internal to... Could be a food court or something. Yeah, you know, like a food, food court or something like that. Right, so to have a food court, you know, is it literally like a little internal inside mall, which is a different animal than if you're going to have multiple tenants, and we don't even know how many tenants. So... Um, I think we need more information about what they're proposing for this particular use. Um, let's get back to the EAF. Well, even on the site plan, uh, in several areas of what I would call the front parking lot, it, it references um, cart returns, which might imply uh, a market of some kind or, uh, again, uh, any kind of retail facility that uses shopping carts. Right. So if there's a need for cart returns. Yep. It has cart returns. So is that a grocery store? Um, right. It might be some kind of, you know, it might be, and part of it might be. Is it Target? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> exactly. It's not, it's not nearly big enough for Target. Right. Target isn't big enough for Target, we've, dis <laughs> we've discovered recently. But, I mean, at... If but the, but is the, it a Costco? <laughs> no. Is it, a, is it a... Not at that square footage. Okay. It, at 55,000 square feet, that's small for almost all supermarket chains. Um, you might be talking about like a specialty market kind of thing at 55,000 square feet if they were using the entirety of the first floor. 47.5 is the first floor, yeah. Right. So I, I can't envision it being... Um, any major chain supermarket, that type of thing, um, they're, they're going through trying to get a grocery store in the, in the Goshen. And one of the big constraints that they have on the lot that they're using is they can basically get a 60,000, 65,000 square foot market in there. And a lot of the name brand companies are balking at that. It's just not big enough to be profitable for, it, that, kind of, for that kind of store. So it, Maybe it's Trader Joe's. <laughs> it, it could be that kind of specialty <laughs> market, that sort of thing. Might, yes, yeah, would be, so, well, you know, I, and, and even that, they might be constrained at. But, but, but that, that would be a more, more doable kind of thing at 55,000. But I think that's, it's, I don't know whether grocery stores in the village's code are the same or different than retail uses. So, you know, I think it'd be, again, I think we need a little more information about what are the mix of uses they're talking about if they have a, a shopping cart area. Is that food service or, you know, food groceries? Or is that you know, some kind of target type? Um, 
you know, smaller scale, you know, one tenant type use. So uh, look, when you you know when you go to Marshalls or TJ Maxx, that kind of store, yeah. there's there's shopping carts. I mean, it could be a another type, a home, yeah. you know, a home type. I mean, there's different kinds of things, but there's just clues in this site plan that sort of point to one bigger use or at least one major use and then maybe some minor above perhaps well or you know in one section of the building might be small right. um you know leaseholds but that it seems like the majority of the retail space will be one unit but we don't know no that's that's part of the problem right so right the operations if they can It'd be useful to clarify is that when they open and so that means there'll be traffic and you know customers coming to and from at 6 a.m or is it that it's just opening so that the employees get there you know and part of that is trip generation you know whether you're talking about have if you're having customers from 6 a.m to 11 p.m it's a lot more trips in and out of that market than if it's from 8 a.m M to 10 p.m. And because there, there's very few employee cars before and after. A re, you know, you're talking about a dozen, maybe a couple of dozen. It's, it's just not much traffic. Um, you know, but particularly between 6 and 8 a.m., for example, um, there's not a lot of bus stops in that area, but there are a few. And, you know, it's if you're driving customer traffic right. in and at 6 a.m., it also could be a just, whole different thing. It could be some commuter traffic, too. So Right. So with regard to noise, when you look at the EAF, it says, we'll propose action, remove existing natural barriers that act as a noise barrier or screen. It's checking no, but they're removing woodland there. So yes, they are. And so I think part of the impacts are the removal of natural barriers to noise. Um, will the proposed action have outdoor lighting? They talk about the mounted parking lot lights direct to the property. Um, will it produce odors? They're saying no. <laughs> action include any bulk storage of petroleum? They're saying no. Um, proposed action use pesticides? No. Uh, require management of solid waste? Yes, two tons per week. Cardboard and plastic will be recycled. They'll have a compactor. That should all be covered in the EIS too, just as part of their project description or somewhere. Uh, hazardous waste, they're saying no. We already talked about the ESA, land uses. Was there anything else that was triggered from your review of the EAF? Um, n no, but honestly, from the scoping document, one thing that I, that I kind of missed talking about is I didn't really feel like there was much in the way of conversation about what mitigation measures are going to be during construction. Um, what's going to be done? It looks like it's going to be a fairly clear-cut site. Um, it looks like right up to where the slope is leading uh, into the back end of the, of the park, what's going to be done to control stormwater runoff and erosion during construction? Um, I, I, think, I think there's nothing in there that points to that that I observed. Other than the requiring the erosion and sediment control plan, which, right. which would address that. So... They have, does it include species bats? But they actually don't say what bats. <laughs> Indiana, Northern Long-Eared. Usually the EAF brings up something with regard to um, the type of bat, but maybe this is what was generated. I haven't seen this before. Um, public resources, on or near, ag and markets, agricultural. Yeah, and I mean, normally it does. Yeah. Uh, archaeological, so they already, well, they have to do archaeological, certainly because of their SWIP, but it did say sensitive archaeological area. Uh, they talk about the long path being um, five miles away, but there, isn't there a closer path that goes, there, there's a closer path than the long path? Heritage Trail, you mean? Well, the Heritage Trail, for sure. They're going to be visible probably from the heritage trail so uh, they could very well be visible from the heritage trail um i think that's a resource i don't, I don't think that there's a closer uh hiking path though 
other than the long path through uh, that area. All right. So, I mean, they should address any impacts to the Heritage Trail in general. Uh, so that's the EAF. So I think um, those are a lot of comments. Uh, Ashley will put something together for us to submit. Um, she'll draft it up. We could take a look at it if, as we review this, um, we come up with any other comments or um, questions or, you know, either share it with everybody or certainly send it over to Ashley so she can incorporate it. What's our time frames for this when we want to get this in? Let's look at the, when was... A second. All right. So today is. <laughs> yeah, you can see what meeting I was in beforehand. Bonnie. Yes. I'm sorry. One last thing I forgot to bring up. Um, from current events, it seems that there is a serious proposal, if nothing else, to um, start building the Larkin Street extension between Route 208 and Forest Avenue. And that could have a significant impact, uh, frankly, in a positive way, in my opinion, on the traffic in the project area. But nothing in what I read in the traffic study today, um, frankly, I don't think they had an indication of that at that time. Um, although it's been long on the books as a possibility since 2004, as I recall, um, no one's really gotten serious about doing anything. But recent news says that may be changing. Uh, a lot of the traffic that's directed through the, particularly the North Main uh, Scunamonk intersection coming from the highway right. and to the highway may be diverted by that. And right. I, I think they have to take that into consideration with what their overall plan is. That, that's a good point. So we should be including in the transportation the potential of the Larkin Drive extension and if that occurs, how it affects any traffic improvements at the Scunamonk North Main and that whole um, area uh, of road network and improvements. Which also brings the question, does the village have anything else that they've already had in the works or in the plans to make changes in that area? I know it's an area of interest for the village board and, and others in the village as far as making improvements there, how far they've gotten with that concept, we don't know, but have those conversations been open and have that been taken into consideration under the traffic portion? Um, so we were talking about dates to get things back to Ashley. Today is the 16th. Um, you said they need them by the 2nd. So Ashley, if we get something, anything remaining, well, to you by the 22nd, and you provide us a draft by like the 24th, and we could finalize by the 26th, is, it, is that too tight or would that work? Yeah, so you have... Okay. Yeah, I mean, whatever works for you, and then we can get, if, um, Sean, you have any other, you know, comments to elaborate, and then we just have to make sure we get it to them in by the second, if that's the date. Okay. So, 
Um, I will make a motion that we authorize our planning board attorney to consolidate all the comments that we raised this evening and that have been provided to her, um, including the engineer's comments, and uh, prepare a memo that will go to the village planning board as lead agency um, for the proposed 208 business center. Um, so I'll make that motion. May I have a second? I'll second that motion. Noreen? <laughs> Bonnie Franson. Aye. Jeff Manson. Aye. John Allegro. Aye. Pat Shea. Aye. Lisa McQuaid. Aye. And Anthony Vaccaro and Jason are not here. Well, one's not here, and then I think one. One is recused. We, yeah, we have to probably say recused. Sorry. That's okay. All right. So I think um, that's it on 208 Business Center. That was the one item on our agenda other than um, doing minutes. Uh, so with that, Ashley, if you would like, you are excused. Okay. Yeah, as soon as we have the recording, we should probably get some minutes real quick over to, to Ashley. I will with this one, definitely. Great. I have quite a few notes, but a lot of them are scrambled. Yeah, so when we have that from George, then we can make sure they yeah, all... Yeah, you should get it up by tomorrow afternoon. Okay. So I'll good. get them over to you as soon as I can, Ashley. Great. Okay, great. I don't all know right. whether... Have a good night, wait, Thank don't you. leave yet. Oh, wait. Hold on. I don't know whether I should have her... We got a phone call from the Chester Fire Department. Troutbrook, who's partially on village property and partially, I mean, the village of Chester and part of the town of Monroe. So they're going to be redoing their entire building. And the chairman from the town of Chester, who called you, I don't know whether that's why he called you, I don't know whether you talked to him yet. Um, he was wanting to leave everything up to the building inspector for the town of Chester but they want to know what your feedback is. Do you want to be an involved agency, an interested agency, or it doesn't matter. You're only like 25 feet within the land. The building has nothing in the villa, in the town of Monroe. They gave me the SBL. Yeah, if they, if they have any kind of conceptual site plan or something, just so we could see. Okay. You know, if, sure if it's if just a renovation, it. you know, I don't, I don't know if they're expanding it. If they're, he says I, we don't we're know. doing like almost the whole building. Okay, yeah, just so we know what it is and then we can respond. Okay. No problem. I didn't know whether I needed Ashley for that, so that's why I didn't want her to leave yet. Yeah, well, she. It's, it's the fire company um, property out on Lakes Road, the Trout, Trout Brook. Brook okay. And it looks like they're doing. Um, they're going to do like a whole reno, but the leading into the property, like he said, 25 feet is the town. And everything, the town of Monroe, and everything else falls under the town of Chester. Right. So I think we just need to see what, if any, changes they're making. Okay. Um, because if the planning board doesn't have any jurisdiction over it, then we're just an interested agency. Okay. Um, but we need to see exactly what they're doing. You know, if they move the driveway, that's more probably the highway superintendent. But, in fact, that's county road, right? So, um, right. yeah. So let's... Let's see what they have, if they have anything. Okay. They just called and said to please bring it up tonight. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yeah, you thank you. Have a good night. Good night. And Sean, good night, you too. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Sean. Bye. All right. So, minutes. We, got, we have to go to October 8th. Mm. I put the changes in that you sent to me already. Okay. I don't think I recirculated it after I changed those, though. Let me just bring up on my desktop here. First, let, oh, let me sort by do, 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 Monroe. <laughs> All right. Uh, these are the minutes. All right. So let's see, we have Anthony out, Jason is out, but Lisa, myself, Jeff, Pat, we're all here. So we can, um, if we want to approve these minutes. Did I, I already submitted my um, comments to. How can I fix them? Anybody have any other additional comments on October 8th? 
whatever it is. So hearing none, um, I will make a motion to approve the October 8th, 2020 minutes. May I have a second? Second. Good night, Ward. Good night, Ward. Um, Bonnie Franson? Aye. Jeff Manson? Aye. John Allegro? Abstain. Oops, sorry, I gotta write that. <laughs> <laughs> Pat Shea? Aye. And Lisa McQuaid? Aye. Thank okay. you. All right, and I also reviewed these. So these are the October 20th minutes. Okay. Um, and, uh, we're, except for Jason, we're all here. So I'll scroll quick. You didn't send me any changes to those. I don't think I had any. Okay. So this was Raywood Drive. Uh, and then we had DG Management. And then we had Eagle View Estates. And then we were. So, um, not hearing any comments. Uh, would someone make a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Uh, Pat moves. May I have a second? A second. second. Uh, John beat you to it, I think. Bonnie Franson? Aye. Jeff Manson? Aye. John Allegro? Aye. Pat Shea? Aye. Lisa McQuaid? Aye. All right. Then we had, I got to find where I put my, do, 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 Monroe. I don't know that I have the minutes. Did we put them on this agenda? Well. Yeah. October 8th. They were the last ones I sent last Tuesday. 20th and November or 12th. last Thursday I did sent I, them. Did everybody, I didn't have a chance to review it. Did you have a chance? I did. Okay. Anybody else? Or should we hold off to the next meeting? You didn't review? I didn't review. No. No. All right. Let's okay. hold off. That's fine. All right. Yep. Okay. Uh, anything that anybody want to bring up before we adjourn? Okay. So with that, I'll make a motion that we adjourn. May I have a second? No. <laughs> John stays second. all night. We're never adjourning. <laughs> Lisa second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. With that, the motion carries. The meeting is over. Thank you very much.